Welcome to this presentation from the Downey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are located in the greater Los Angeles area at 9820 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. We would love to have you worship with us any Saturday you are in our area. Hello, everyone. From us here, giving you a warm welcome to our online service this week. I wish you a happy Sabbath and many blessings this morning. We'd love to hear from everyone, so please leave us a comment. You can say hi or happy Sabbath, or maybe leave us a prayer request. We're so happy to have you watching with us. Have a wonderful day, and God bless. Good morning, everybody. Let's have a couple quick announcements today. We are starting our small groups this week. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. It's only going to be four weeks this time, so you want to make sure not to miss any as best you can. Hopefully everybody has their book from our drive through last week, or maybe Pastor brought you the book uh, this week. Uh, talk to Pastor if you didn't get a book yet. We have a few left. Um, also, we sent out an email to everybody that has the, the overview pages, with the prayer request and the braze reports and, and those kinds of things and the readings, when to do the readings. There's six chapters in the book. We're only doing four weeks, so you got to check out that reading to see what's chapter to read for which week. We're asking everybody, please read the chapter before you get to your small group. That's just going to help us. The chapters are short. They're only a few pages each. Um, you may want to look through the questions as well and, and be ready to discuss those uh, when you get to the group. So we're really looking forward to this, hoping everybody signed up and uh, we're ready to go for this. Uh, our second announcement is, you know, if we haven't had a chance to get to know you yet or, or uh, talk to you a little bit, we just would love an opportunity to do that. So uh, if you could text the word welcome to our phone number at 562 869-6013. That's 562-869-6013. And we just love an opportunity to chat with you for a little bit, get to know you some. Um, it'd be great opportunity for us to see who all is watching and stuff. Uh, additionally, please like, subscribe, maybe click the bell below. Uh, that helps us spread the word. The more people that, that like this and and share it uh, the more people that see it. That's just the way it works. Um, the algorithm helps um, things that get lots of likes get shared more. So when you're clicking like or subscribe or share, you're helping us do evangelism. You know, that's, that's super cool. Easiest evangelism you ever did. Just a button click. So thank you so much for that. We hope that you all have a great week. We're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning. God bless. Father, Lord, we are so grateful to you for the church family that you have given us and for the love and encouragement that we receive from each member. I lift up the wider church family and pray that you will meet each one in their own particular time of need. I especially bring before you our brothers and sisters in Christ that have been affected by the pandemic and the current climate in our country. May you provide strength and comfort in the Lord Jesus during these times of trouble. We are so grateful that the arms of love within the body of Christ is stretched out to the four corners of the world. Loving Father, we long for peace, and indeed we pray for peace in our country and around the world. We pray for strength and faith in the face of troubles and dissent. We pray for courage and discernment in times of disagreements without amicable discourse. We pray that you will be done and that in turn healing can take place. We pray that you will put in us a spirit of service, a spirit of love towards one another. Give us your grace and calmness of heart to channel the love that you have bestowed upon all of us. Help us to love and to show it in our words and actions every day. Heavenly Father, open our eyes to see the purpose of our existence and the importance of concentrating foremost in the things of eternity. May we be faithful to share the message of salvation with others who are yet in need of you. Thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation and thank you 
that by believing in you, we now have a passage to the promise of salvation and eternal life. And so, Lord Jesus, we can say with confidence, we receive you into our lives as our Savior, and we choose to follow you and serve you all the days of our lives. Thank you for hearing our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, friends. By now, I'm sure that some of you are wondering, when are we going to reopen the church? Well, I'm here to give you a quick update on where we are at in that process. So this past Tuesday evening, uh, I and all the other pastors of the Southern California Conference met with the senior administration. And we went over the guidelines developed by the, the conference's uh, Coronavirus Intervention Committee to reopen the church. Now, these guidelines are based on the state, county, and conference requirements. And after reviewing the guidelines, all I can say is, well, they are very strict and very firm and, and in some ways very limiting. Uh, and uh, some areas they've relaxed, but in others they've become even more stringent, especially on the county. And this is going to have a large impact on how we can worship in person. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail at this time because, frankly, it would just take too long. However, what I will say is that we are currently readjusting to the new requirements. And once approved, we will report back, uh, approved by the board. Now, ideally, we'd like to report back in the next couple of weeks once, again, the church board can discuss and approve it. It's been a long and trying year. I know, but we are close. So thank you for your patience, and we wish you well, and God bless. and happy Sabbath. I hope everybody is doing well today. So today's story is about treasure. Now, if you found out that you had treasure in your house, would you not do everything you could to find it? This is exactly what happened to Jordan when his father took him to visit his grandfather's property. He handed him a treasure map and told him that there was treasure hidden somewhere in the property. Now, Jordan was so excited that he right away got to looking and he was looking all around the property, up and down and everywhere you can think of. Now, a couple hours later, when he had been looking for so long, Jordan started to get a little hungry, so he went inside to eat. Then he started feeling a little tired, so he took a nap. And eventually, when he woke up, he kind of wanted to play his video games. So Jordan kind of started forgetting about the treasure, and he never really remembered until one day, when a friend needed his help, and he needed some money. So Jordan, in an effort to raise some money, would go to certain scavenger hunts that he knew he could win easy prizes. He would also go to his dad and ask for money. But he never really took time to keep looking for the treasure on his grandfather's property. Now, much like this, we do the same with God's Word, the Bible. The God's Word left us the Bible as a treasure map to find His wisdom, which is the hidden treasure, to understand His words. But all too often, we don't look for it, and so we miss out on all that treasure that God has given us. Much like it says in Proverbs 2, 1 through 6, My son, if you accept my words and store my commands with you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry out loud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the Lord gives you wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello, friends. I hope and pray you are well. Let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, today we embark on a new journey and a, a season of, of understanding the Holy Spirit, Lord, especially as we begin our small groups, as we discuss and di uh, do a deep dive in this particular topic, Lord. We pray that you will help open our minds and our hearts to be receptive, to be understanding, but also, Lord, may we take this knowledge and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. To begin with, I want to share a story. Uh, I believe it, uh, it was in Reader's Digest, I think, um, Dr. Anderson. 
He tells of a, a story of a, a young pilot who had just passed the point of no return when the weather had changed for the worst. And visibility it drops to a matter of feet as the fog descended on the earth. And putting total trust in the cockpit's instruments was a new experience for him. And so even though the ink was still wet on the certificate verifying that he was qualified for instrument flying, he had that rating, but still he was nervous. Worst of all, the landing, that's what concerned him the most. In fact, his destination was a crowded metropolitan airport he was not familiar with. And in a few minutes, he would be in radio contact with the tower. But until then, he was alone with his thoughts. His instructor had practically forced him to memorize the rule book, and he didn't care for it at the time, but now he was thankful. Finally, he heard the voice of an air traffic controller. It said, I'm going to hold, put you in a holding pattern, the controller radioed. And so he thought, great. However, he knew that his safe landing was in the hands of this person. He had to draw upon his previous instructions and training and trust the voice of the air traffic controller that he himself, he couldn't even see. Now, aware at this time was, sorry, at this time, there was no time for pride. And so he said, this is not a seasoned pro up here, okay? I'm a, I'd appreciate any help that you could please, please give me. So the air traffic, air, tra air traffic controller responded, you got it, man. So for the next 45 minutes, the controller gently guided the pilot through the blinding fog. And as course and altitude corrections came periodically, the young pilot realized that the controller was guiding him around obstacles and away from potential collisions with the words of the rule book firmly placed in his mind. And with the gentle voice of the controller, he landed safely <laughs> at last. Now, when the Holy Spirit guides us through the maze of life, much like that air traffic controller, the air traffic controller assumed that the young pilot understood the instructions of the flight manual, and his guidance was based on that. And such is the case with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit can guide us if we have a knowledge of God's word and his will as established in our minds. Now, when we think of the Holy Spirit, when we even think about God, we, we sometimes think of it, you know, we identify. In fact, dictionary says the identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. So what is, what is the Holy Spirit? Well, for instance, it's uh, one third of the Trinity. There are three parts, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Now, the first two we can easily identify with. You have the Father, most of us, all at least, have a father? Well, we've all had a father, but do we have a relationship? Unfortunately, not everyone does. But yet, we, we also uh, know what it's like, uh, for instance, to have, for all of you parents, for those who have boys, some of us, obviously, I know what it's like to be a son. In, in Ephesians 4, 6, it says, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So, God sometimes is known as the father. And so we, when we think of a father, we think of a parental figure, maybe a source of strength. Or if you're at odds, maybe especially in your, your teenage angst, maybe there's uh, signs of friction and, and uh, conflict. But, but ultimately, we, we, we know that uh, dads, they care and they love for their children and want the best for them. In scripture, we also find that there is God the Son. In fact, one of the most well-known verses, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For all of you uh, parents out there, you know what having a son uh, is like. You know what it means. And all the boys, you know what it means to be a boy. But the Holy Spirit, it's a little harder to discern. When you say the Holy Spirit to some, that might mean perhaps some mystical being, or even in, in scripture, sometimes it's referred to as, uh, as a ghost. <laughs> now, when we look through scripture though, we see that the work of the Holy Spirit is evident. In fact, even uh, we have our own fundamental belief 
uh, I believe it's number five, actually, where God, the eternal spirit, was active with the Father and the Son in creation, incarnation, and redemption. He inspired the writers of the scripture. He filled Christ's life with power. He draws and convicts human beings and those who respond. He renews and transforms into the image of God. He was sent by the Father and the Son to be always with his children. He extends spiritual gifts to the church. He empowers it to bear witness to Christ and in harmony with the scriptures, leads it into all truth. Now, when you go back to scripture in the Hebrew and in the Greek, the Hebrew word is nefesh and in Greek it's pneuma. And both translate as wind or breath. There are brief passages where the Holy Spirit is, sorry, there are a number of, passages where the Holy Spirit is located in Scripture. For instance, the term Spirit of God is mentioned 28 times in the Old Testament alone. And additionally, as we just indicated, it's described as a breath or a wind. Um, you know, when, when you go back to Genesis 1, it indicates that the Holy Spirit helped to create the heavens and the earth. And in, in 2 Peter 1.21, it says the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Bible. And even in John 3, verse 8, Jesus himself likened the Holy Spirit to being like the wind. And even in uh, Jesus' baptism, it played a role. The book of Mark points out that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove when coming up out of the baptismal waters. And Luke also writes that Jesus left his baptism in the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit. And in Mark, Again, the Holy Spirit sent, uh, Spirit of God then sent and led Jesus into the wilderness. If you, if you read the book of Acts, as, as we've done the last couple of months, you'll, you'll know that there are so many examples of where the Holy Spirit acted or intervened or came upon the people. In fact, again, you could, you could also call that book the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Now, briefly, just as a kind of a surprise maybe to some of you, the early pioneers of the Adventist church were not in one accord on the, the understanding of the Trinity. In fact, some of our early church pioneers, they rejected the idea of the Trinity. However, as, as time went by, as faithful stewards of, of God's word, they came to the conclusion that the Father and the Son are three in one. Now, next week, we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. But just as Jesus promised the disciples that the Holy Spirit would lead and guide them, so too do we have the gift and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now in our reading uh, for this week for the small group, the author of our small group uh, book points out that there are three things to be mindful of, especially with the Holy Spirit that sometimes can be challenging. So again, he goes back to John 3 when, when Jesus meets Nicodemus, and, and uh, I'll read it again. In John 3, especially verse 8, it says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, Seth, the author of our, our small group book, draws a couple of conclusions. In fact, three conclusions. Number one, sometimes the Holy Spirit is at times it's unfamiliar. And, and sometimes it's uncontrollable and, and it's unpredictable. Now, as humans, I, I think that we sometimes, we like to have things in control. And, and, and yet with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. We cannot control it, and that perhaps can sometimes be frustrating. And uh, just to kind of draw a little bit of what's, what's, the, what's the function of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is there to lead, to guide, and to convict. This Holy Spirit, can I trust it? Absolutely. Holy Spirit works in our lives to help, again, lead and to guide us. Glenn Newton actually makes this, uh, this illustration where uh, he asks the question of, you have your, your washer that washes the clothes, and what's that middle part in the middle that just moves back and forth and shakes the clothes uh, all around, or maybe spins it? It's called the agitator. And what's the purpose of the agitator? Well, it's to agitate the clothes so that it can cause havoc and to get all the dirt off of the clothes. It's there to shake and separate the clothes from all of the grime, perhaps all of the money and everything that might be in or on the clothes. 
And as, as we accept the Holy Spirit and move into our, as the Holy Spirit moves into our hearts, the Holy Spirit comes in, starts to change and to agitate and move and to, to clean our hearts. There's a lot of things in there. Some, one of the things that could be there is even our own selfish desires. And yet we need to move past our own selfish desires and to desire to what God wants to have in our lives. There are some things that are hard to let go. Things of the world that have a way of just wanting to latch on and not want to let go that can just stay with us. Sometimes it's hard to get that stuff out. Sometimes it seems like, is it ever going to leave? Now, the Holy Spirit does not want us to continue in that life, but to move us forward. So he begins to gently and lovingly begins to agitate and shake up our lives to convict us of the things that needs to, to leave our heart. God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The only way we can do that is to have a place in our lives where Holy Spirit can come and to reside, to do the work that's needed to get all the junk and all the dirt out of our lives. And then truly can the work of God really impact us and we can go forth and share the good news to be filled with His Spirit. And so, much like a washing machine, our lives are also like a washing machine. The Holy Spirit constantly moving about, within, con, uh, uh, convicting us in our hearts and our minds because He loves us so much. The truth is that God wants to be able to fill us, with us, fill us up with the Holy Spirit. But it's your choice. It's up to you. Do you want to be led by God? Do you want to give everything and surrender your whole life to God? Everything that happened in the past, that's happening now, and especially the future, do you want to give to God? All of your control, your finances, your habits, especially your family, your friends, everything that is important to you, can you totally surrender to God? I want to encourage you to invite God, and especially the Holy Spirit, to work in your life. And as we continue to journey in the next month, I hope and pray that this will be a time of understanding and growth and that you'll have a better uh, idea of what the Holy Spirit means to us and to work in your life. May God bless you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, be with us as we venture forth. Continue to lead and guide us. May we be your people. And Lord, uh, may the Holy Spirit do a wonderful work, not just in our individual lives, but for us as a church to go forth in Downey and wherever we live, wherever we work, to, uh, to be your people, that others may know who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace, everyone. Have a great week. Take care.